So today's focused around two big exercises in how people actually collaborate. Um, yeah, so there's one where we focus on what would work in a small team. So basically a centralized workflow where everyone has access to one repository and one which would be used in large projects where people don't request access before proposing changes. So if you want more exercises, today is the day. I think the first, the first exercise will be a realistic starting point for most groups and teams. The second exercise is not only for big projects, but it's also suggesting changes to somebody else's project that you maybe don't collaborate with. So it can also be a small project. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's true, yeah. Or don't collaborate with yet. Yeah. And so today is the day if there's people in your group that use Git and version control, but they use it alone and you would like for them to use it with you together. Today is the, today is the day to invite them or the day to show them the videos or whatever it may be. Okay. So today we will take together with Sabri, together with Richard here mm -hmm. in the studio, we will take Git to the, to the next level. And instead of working on our own, we will now collaborate. We will collaborate within teams. We will collaborate in exercise groups, but we will also try to collaborate with all solo participants who participate in this workshop through stream. So that will be exciting because we don't know exactly what will happen. It's one of my favorite parts of the workshop. Um, we will learn how to, yesterday we have introduced these concepts, so, but we have only mentioned them, like cloning, pushing, pulling. But today we want to give it a meaning and understanding. And we will learn how we can use these push, pull, clone, and some other concepts, how we can use them for collaboration. A central, uh, central topic today will be code review. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the, yeah, go ahead. The first time I saw this lesson taught in an in person code refinery, I was sort of amazed at how like it was so interactive and hands on and like what we'd really do. But doing it with a stream where possibly several hundred people are collaborating, that's another matter. So we'll see. Should we begin then? Yes. Um, should we introduce ourselves, Richard, or people know about us? Well, I guess maybe we should reintroduce. So, Sabri, mm. um, yes, tell us about you. Yes, yes. Um, thank you, Richard, for all this um, and others. Um, the team. So we are, we are just here um, now, starting this lesson. But there's a lot of work already done coming to this point. So everybody who's uh, um, uh, the effort, the effort they have put on is, uh, I would like to thank first. So my name is Sabri and I work at University of Oslo as an engineer for, with uh, high performance computing. And I have also been uh, teaching um, on code refinery for some time and uh, looking forward to doing this col collaborative lesson uh, with you. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Radovan, would you like to quickly reintroduce yourself? Yes, it's a pleasure to. So Radovan Bast, University of Chomso. And I also want to thank the team. It's an incredible team effort. It's really fun to be part of this. I also want to say thanks for the feedback that we got in the last days. Um, I really appreciate the feedback that some things were too fast. We, we didn't clearly say when it's OK to to not type along uh, and this feedback is really important for me and we will try to implement this so thanks to everybody and i'm richard darst i'm at alto university in finland and 
is my other motivational phrase is that once you can collaborate with the kind of people that are in code refinery here it's just amazing what you can do so i'd like to thank everyone for that and invite others to join us you'll learn a lot so with that said should we begin get collaborative will someone share the screen um, I guess, uh, Radhawan, it will be a nice idea that you share the screen and maybe uh, see whether we can go through a recap, small, uh, like we're not a fast one, but a brief one of uh, what we are, where we are now. It sounds really good. Uh, of course, I wish there were more questions now and I can need to do a little bit of recap, but I will share screen. Let's see what we get. So on top is the collaborative document. Everybody welcome to type. We have icebreaker questions, but here down below uh, would be really nice to get questions about Git, about the last days before we start out with, uh, with collaborative Git. Uh, maybe a recap would be that um, we have discussed branching yesterday on um, actually on day one and branching now will be essential uh, we have said that for single person projects if it's your own project um, if many people work on one branch only it's the main branch or the master branch and that's completely okay but now that we start collaborating we will see that there is really no other way once we start collaborating with git we are by definition on different branches. So now we will need it. It will be a natural thing. So this connection to day one and day two. Yesterday we have briefly and too fast demonstrated how conflicts look. We will today see hopefully more conflicts. Um, while we resolve them in the, in the terminal, today we will learn how to resolve a conflict through our browser. Uh, so Radwan, uh, looking at the HackMD's um, last mm -hmm. few days, maybe especially yesterday. Mm -hmm. uh, so if if I I would I would recommend that if people still have SSH key issues, that they don't try to solve it during the lesson, but follow us, and maybe after the lesson um, they could uh, have a look at the videos, um, because if you are already having this SSH issue and um, you might not be able to. Uh, sort of fully participate in this collaborative um, lesson that we are going to explain, but trying to solve that might sort of uh, put you off. <clears throat> That's a great point. And yesterday also somebody wrote on the document that this SSH keys don't work for me and now I have to disconnect and I will not watch the rest of the workshop. And it's, it's really pity. Oh, I wish we had said yesterday that it's still really valuable if you if this doesn't work and you watch the rest and you will not even need it for the rest of the day, even that we didn't say. Um, so if this doesn't work, indeed, maybe the best way to participate is to, to watch us reviewing other people's work. We will be sent each other modifications and we will learn how to, how to submit them, how to review them. I think you will get a lot of out of it, even if you cannot participate um, yourself. All of everything we will do, we record and we will put it out on 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 YouTube. So also you can you can rewatch it. Definitely want to avoid frustration uh, with with this workshop. Yes, um, Radovan, uh, can I start the lesson? Um, share the, the the schedule and start it from now, or do you want more discussions on past few days? Just wondering whether anything really important we forgot. I think we are ready to start. So please take the screen from me mm. and you will lead us through to the first part, which is the concepts and motivation. Thank you, Radovan. Um, so as, as we have been um, informing everybody, so keep the questions coming. So there are no stupid questions or like silly questions. 
if, if you if you if you have a question probably another person already thought about it as well so um use the hack md uh, as you have been doing in the past few days um so we are in this uh, lesson page on the third day now um so today we are going to present um about collaborative uh, distribution versus control uh, taking the lessons that you already learned to the next level so i'm going to click on this so i can um, start the lessons rather on me and uh, richard will be uh, we'll try to uh, go through these lessons with you so <clears throat> let's uh, let's step uh, back a little bit and and think uh, motivate ourselves a little bit about why we need um and how we are going to share um, our code that we have it on our laptop the for example the the cooking recipes uh, the gokumal recipe or whatever exercises we did we have it on our laptop so how do we uh, make this accessible to others um so one thing you could do is um you could um, compress it or like archive the folder as it is and you can send it via email um so if you uh, send via email it could it will start an email thread and people if they if if they contribute um changes to certain files um then it might be hard to track when it was changed or like who has changed last uh, that sort of complications uh, but this could be really uh, complicated if there are more than one file so we do that sometimes using uh, um like without without talking words like using terms like git we use uh, google docs uh, microsoft uh, track changes uh, or star office uh, track changes uh, and there are there is inbuilt version control which uh, do these things behind the scenes without we are sort of explicitly asking to do it so if there are some undo so then there is some version control going on um, and you could also go back to versions but these are not sophisticated enough to handle the sort of version controlling or the sharing environment that we need in uh, coding um then we have we can have uh, a single person um having a uh, having their code on the web which will uh, help us uh, with the help the person to uh, sort of uh, advertise the code uh, and um keep track of the projects but then uh, it becomes um uh, it, it it is practically you could you could uh, you could do that but as a single person then uh, you you might have to uh, uh take care of everything that comes with the um, code sharing you know you have to uh, if somebody uh, asks for some help then you have to provide it yourself then if uh, somebody contributes something then you have to review that yourself so it becomes Uh, might or become overwhelming if it becomes more popular then a group like the code refinery um the the git github um, the the repository we have uh, for a small team it's it's very good so everybody part of uh, inside this trusted circle so everybody could welcome to contribute and they could use um, uh, branches for example to keep their work slightly separate um then we will talk about um a terms like forks um we'll come back to that later it is just uh taking a copy of a uh, repository and working on your own and then um contributing back um so if you think of about this list uh, from sharing a folder to a one person repository to a common group repository to a fork it becomes more easier to contribute to something that you are not the sole owner so that's the technical benefit of that um radhan do you want to uh, say anything more about this motivation part just maybe taking one step back what we really want is we want and we want to find out an easy way to make changes to to code we want to find an easy way to work independently on projects and we want to find an easy way to combine these developments and we will see that uh we will see a couple of approaches to to realize this we also want to find an easy way to track problems and suggestions so it's about suggestions it's about change proposals 
and working together and combining these without too much manual work. Yes, Radha um, Thank you very much for that, 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 that combining and independent work, combining those two words that uh, I missed to mention, and those are very important part of this uh, workflow we are really talking about. Uh, you will need a basic understanding of Git, which means you have been in the past uh, two days is, uh, is taken as basic understanding, or you already know some Git in order to uh, follow this lesson. And you need a GitHub account with SSH keys configured. Uh, if you don't have that, don't, do, uh, don't try to do it now, but just follow the lesson and maybe you can follow up later on the, uh, with the videos after you configure it. Um, okay, Ranon, I'll move to the uh, next part. Sounds great. So, um, so we, we have this um, um, the collaboration. So, uh, what, what does uh, what, what does collaboration means to you, Radwan? So, what what does it mean? The word. Well, working together, working in a coordinated way towards a common goal. Mm. So the common goal, the coordination, and the terms you uh, mentioned before, like uh, ability to work independently but combine your work, those, you know, some um, some motivation for this um, um, lesson and also for some explanation of how this code collaboration works. Um, so um, let's say someone given you access to a repository online and you want to contribute. So you 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 saw your <clears throat> let's um, let's take a, a simple example like. Uh, the lessons that, that lesson that we are uh, going through, uh, somebody want to make a change, and uh, we gave access to that uh, repository, um, and it is quite easy to make a copy and then um, uh, make the make the improvement and send it back. Um, so first, um, what we do is we get um, a copy. So, uh, uh, so Radon, I would like um, I, I would try to avoid using other terms to terms that already mentioned, like, you know, we have terms like fork and commit and uh, clone and other things. So we could sort of talk about other, uh, we could explain using other terms, like, you know, copying or my local copy or remote copy, uh, but this clone and fork, if we try to sort of understand the concept as it is, I think it's uh, more um, easier than we introduce more terms. So what do you think about it, Radhavan? So is it, should we sort of explain these terms more first or shall we see what, how they uh, work out? I mean, I trust your judgment here. Oh, yes. I agree that we should be very careful with too many concepts, too many, too much jargon. Mm. So let's be very careful about how we call these things. And sometimes yeah. the names are not very intuitive because they are they are this way for historical reasons because these terms have evolved from something. So I trust the so, judgment. Lead me where yes. how, where where we yes. go. So the the reason I mentioned is that if I mention something a word or like a term something uh, that not here that might confuse you, you should immediately stop me and sort of ask for an explanation. Um, uh, so the um, we'll go through the terms a little bit. As you said, it, it might not be intuitive. Uh, so the repository is the um, is is the uh, if you if you go for if you um, look at the, the the laptop that where you did the Git in it and that folder. So that is the Git uh, repository that we are talking about. Everything inside that. Uh, I uh, I like to consider the Git repository as the dot Git folder inside that folder, which contains all the history and the commits and everything uh, that's um, contained in it. Um, but there are others might consider the, also the working tree. That means the files that have been edited, but not uh, completely um, informed Git about. For example, if you edit a file and if you do not do a Git add, whether it's part of the repository or not, you know, that might slightly change, but you could, uh, you could think of it as that place where the Git in it was, um, um, uh, performed either on your laptop and today uh, on the cloud. So the branch also um, people use different ways to understand it. Um, so um, a branch is more often uh, I have seen as um, 
as explained as a commit. You know, it's it's a point in time um, that uh, that is referred. It's referred to a commit. Now we know a commit what it is. Um, but I have um, uh, sort of um, um, sort of got used to understanding it as a commit and all its all its ancestry. Uh, so um, it's you could sort of uh, try to understand. Uh, a branch as uh, you know refer to a commit, but it would make more sense going forward um, if you are if you are if you already have an understanding of a branch, just uh, um, keep that understanding to this lesson. Um, so my understanding is the a commit and its ancestry, and it's a very lightweight uh, component of Git. That means if uh, if you think about, uh, if you if you can see, the, I see, yeah, it's, it's the, if you, in this diagram, you have this blue branch and this red branch and the experiment branch, all of them share this first uh, blue ancestor. So this, uh, any, any data, any capacity that is um, uh, needed to have this first node is not repeated three times. So there's only one instance of that. Um, then you could have um, a tag, which is an easier way to refer to a commit really. Um, so you could have like a human understandable uh, label or a, so we have this commemorative plaque now. So some sort of um, um, label that you could under, instead of referring to this uh, complicated hash. Yeah, I think there are two, um, so there are two aspects to a tag. One is that it's typically something that humans understand. So instead of 40 random looking characters, it's it's a tag that is like version 1.0 or paper submitted. So something that we understand. It has the same meaning like a commit hash, like a commit identifier, but we can remember it better and we can recognize it better. And then the second aspect to a tag is that it doesn't move. So it's like something drilled to the wall. It, it stays there to the commit. We don't move it to a different commit in contrast to branches. Okay, uh, that is a very good point. Um, and uh, later on, maybe if we have time, we could check how the tags move uh, across, for, for example, local compute and the cloud as well. Uh, so the tag, um, if you don't explicitly um, inform Git to sort of distribute it everywhere you have your Git, um, it remains on um, in the place where you have define it. Um, uh, so, um, so it, it is an easier way to uh, refer to a commit. But uh, do you think uh, rather one it is a more like as as robust as a commit hash? It is not as robust because <clears throat> although we are not recommended to move this tag to a different place, it is still possible to do. Hmm. Uh, whereas a uh, commit is really unique. So what yes. is a, uh, what is what is cloning? Yesterday we were cloning code. What what happened, really? So the um, cloning. Um, uh, you, you, uh, so uh, if you think about the what happened at the end of the cloning is you have a copy of the repository that you had in your cloud. So it is a it is a, it is a way to copy things. Uh, and if you uh, if you think fork and clone. Uh, as sort of, uh, if you want to um, compare them. So the clone is a local copy and a fork is a cloud copy. So it's inside uh, fork, is inside, inside the GitHub uh, cloud itself. Uh, and then clone uh, is on your laptop uh, or your desktop or where you uh, got, uh, got your local copy in. Uh, so although both of these are copies, the features associated with the cloud copy and the features associated with the clone copy are slightly different, so it's uh, it's good that they have two words, uh, two different terms to refer to this the, uh, these two copies, uh, and it would make sense um, when you go forward. And is it a good time uh, to now also explain what is this origin? Because we see it in this graph. Um, so uh, when you um, when you um, have your cloud instance, the, the, the repository, the version of the, the copy of your repository on the cloud. And when you have a version of, um, um, I shouldn't say the version, uh, a, a copy of the repository on your laptop, 
um, you, you will see two copies. One is on the cloud and one is on the laptop. But behind the scenes, there's a third copy, which is the last time you synchronize with the cloud. So you have your cloud copy, you have laptop copy, and the last synchronization, the last pull or push you did that we will uh, talk about later. So in that, uh, we have something called the origin. So origin is really a um, reference to the address on the cloud. So we have a reference to the uh, address on the cloud, the master branch in the cloud, and then we have the master branch on our um, local um, cop uh, local uh, repository, and then we have the cloud. Uh, did that uh, explain that one, or you want to say something more? I think it was a good explanation. I can maybe add another way to look at it. The way I like to look at it is that the origin is a little note that rem that reminds me where did I clone from. So it will keep track of where was this copied from, and that is that we refer to as origin, and that is it is typically a web address. Very good point. It is a uh, a web address. Um, so um, you know it's it's a convenient way to sort of refer to a long address as well that we learn uh, a little later. So this um, creating from templates and importing repositories are also ways of uh, making copies in slightly different uh, use cases. Uh, let's say that we will practically do this. Let's say you want to make uh, your own repository using as a as a template. Um, uh, what you call is a cookie cutter. Like you, you use a uh, repository uh, to make start your own project, but you don't want all the history. So you start from uh, a single commit, and you start from a uh, your own repository, and you can use uh, the model or the structure or the the um, so the template. The word template makes sense. So I'm not going to explain the word template. So we use, use something to create something else, but not with all the um, uh, history. Uh, and then uh, we have the, the copy thing is also um, like um, you could you could um, think of it as a, like a, the, the process is like a fork, but it is between different cloud providers. Let's say you have a Bitbucket or a um, GitLab um, instance and you want to make a copy in GitHub or the other way around, we call it import because uh, all the other features um, that are uh, not uh, like yeah, uh, the cloud specific features may not be um, repeated. So you, you use it an import. So you, you have the basic Git mechanism and that would make, make, uh, make it possible to sort of have your commits and commit messages and the Git history and the Git logs and the, um, the Git annotate and other things going on. But maybe certain features like a link to an issue might not work after a uh, import. Uh, Radhan, do you want to add anything more? Oh, maybe I can add to the generating from template. I can maybe add a use case where this might be interesting. This might be interesting in your group. Uh, if, let's say, you are supervising students, they come for an internship or for a master thesis, and you want all of them to start with something that looks reasonable, a reasonable repository for a Python project or an R project, then you can generate a template and they can, they can, so you can provide a template, they can generate a repository from it and they have a reasonable folder structure already set up. So that's one use case or for classroom exercises. But I think that's good. I'm also watching the HackMD. There are not no new questions coming, which I wonder whether like something wrong with my network or whether we are too whether it's too obvious or too too fast. Typically, it's a sign that it's too confusing if there are no questions. So we really appreciate questions. No questions is normally uh, not a good sign. Um, yes. Yeah. So I see some questions being answered. Uh, but it's, yeah, as you said, um, not enough. Maybe we could mention, uh, if people could mention if they had used a template in their sort of uh, real life and mention that. And then if you scroll um, down, sorry, there is, of course, I didn't want to jump. So we could, there are these terms that we heard yesterday, pulling, pushing, what is this exactly? 
um so um as i said i will uh, i will try not to use more terms to explain that already the jargon we have uh so pool and fetch we will in the in the first few uh, lessons we will um, we will sort of um, think as as one thing uh, a pool is a fetch and a checkout you know uh, there are two things so if you use the pool it would do the fetch for you so pool is downloading so i'll try to not use more terms but you know that is how it is we could use the word like a download and then push is an upload um so then um then we have uh, learned how to yes make changes and uh then with the the, the work folks folk uh, will um, come come to the uh, play when you cannot upload to somewhere that you if, if you don't have access to that place that you are supposed to upload then you can have your own copy and upload to that place and make a suggestion to the owner that would you like to take the changes uh, and um, incorporate it to your uh, original repository so when you when you can't directly write to something you can make a copy of it and you can make the changes and show the original author that oh person with the right access you know i have this uh, changes that the improvements would you like to incorporate it um anything else uh, you are planning to say about this Pera? so i would like to pick up questions 6 and 7 from hkd because i think they are really good questions and important that we clarify them so question 6 is it common to fork a repository and later to propose changes to be reintegrated into the main repository and yes that is one use case and we will practice that later so one use case is you make a fork if you think that sometime in future i want to contribute some changes back the other use case is you want to make a backup because you, you don't know will the will the i just want to have a copy in my in my user space the yet another use case is you don't want to send any changes back but you want to make your own changes and maybe you will change your mind later and then send them back. So this is the use case. Uh, question seven, when cloning, do we only clone one branch or do we clone everything? So when you clone, you clone everything. There are some options if you really only want to, to clone a particular branch, but normally when you type git clone and an address, you will copy everything, all commits, all branches, all the tags. So that's important to know. So it's also a nice way to back up, which is the one thing I really like about Git is that when you collaborate with, with your colleagues, you get automatically backup basically for free. So if you have five collaborators and they all clone your project, well, you have five backups because they really copy everything. Um... So not not directly relevant, but something I just remembered because I have a uh, um, sort of done something wrong when I'm doing this thing is like if you if you have a fork and you, your intention is to sort of um, contribute back, you should not wait too long. So if you wait too long, the original project might have moved so far. So it's important that if you are forking it, the making the copy, the intention of that is to contribute. You should have um, frequent communication with the original place. And there has um, been an interesting follow-up to question six. So the nice thing about forking and cloning is that we don't have to overthink it. Because if you if you first clone and you work on your computer and later you change your mind and you think, well, this would be really nice to have on, on GitHub GitLab, you can still, you can fork later and then you can push your local changes to the fork. So there is, you cannot make it wrong. You can either fork or clone, and you can change your mind later. And today we will learn how can we how can we do these things? How can we synchronize changes between our computer, the fork, and the central repository? Um, so Radovan, the centralized workflow. Um, so we have some. Uh, Let's see, uh, some teaching and exercise. Would you like to take the lead on that? I would love to. I will take the screen here and we will have a look at the schedule just to 
have a look at the timing. So how are we doing here? We have concepts. We are doing pretty good. So the plan now is we will we will first explain how this works and give you hopefully a really good introduction into the exercise. We will then take a break. And after the break, we will do the exercise. We will collaborate on a project. The exercise will be 40 minutes to give you really enough time. And after that, we will discuss a lot. So this will be really our central, central part of today. So let's go there. Centralized workflow, what is this? So Radovan, uh, in this uh, um, lesson, so if there's some uh, typing or clicking that you're going to do, do you want me to follow you or do you want me to just watch you? <laughs> oh, I'm not sure now, but please ask me again when I, when I start typing. Let's be very clear about that. I think it's a very good question. Mm. We will first start with um, so please remind me about this later. Whenever I start typing, please ask me that again. Centralized workflow, let's go in there. If you open this page here, or alternatively, if, if you click the right button, you arrive to the same page. What we want to do now is collaborate. We want to collaborate on the same repository. Um, what we want to do here is this kind of layout. We, we have a central repository, this red box in the middle. And imagine that inside the box there are branches and commits. And we these blue boxes, they are our computers. So we will clone, we will clone the repository, we will create a branch, do some changes, and we will send send our changes to the central. We will upload our changes to the central repository. This is a layout that is typical for many, most projects, small projects. This will be, this will be very typical for your research group, how, how they can collaborate. It's so important. when you when you say central, is it something like like a central works uh, like a central station where all the trains pass, or is it something that we we define ourselves, but it doesn't have any technical technically special meaning? So how yeah. how, how how does something become central? That's really an uh, important question. We call it central because we have agreed. So these six people here, they have agreed that this is the, this is our central place. This is where we have our main development of the code. From Git's perspective, all of them are equivalent because all of them can carry all the commits, all the branches. So the central one is not, from Git's perspective, there is nothing special central about it. They are all equivalent. The only difference is that we have agreed that this is our central place. And also after we have cloned all of these blue clones will remember where they were cloned from. So they will they will have this label origin and the origin will refer to central. That's the only difference between those. What we need for this collaboration is that for this to work, all of these people here need permissions to, to write to the central repository, to push to the central repository. So later in the exercise, we, you will need to be added as a collaborator. So this really only works when, when we are all collaborators in the same co repository. So this works very nicely for research groups that know each other. But sometimes you want to also contribute to a project where you are not a collaborator, they don't know you, and we will do that later. So later we will see that this is possible as well. So typically all developers have read and write permissions. All the developers are typically in the same group or organization or project. This is really nice for projects. This is also how, how we collaborate in Code Refinery on lessons. 
we typically use this layout here. It can be, we have mentioned that yesterday with Dania briefly, that in this setup, it can be a good idea to write protect the main branch, which is typically master or main. And all the changes will go via branches. This is also what we will do in the exercise. So Radon, when you say write protect, it means that uh, it could be written through due procedure, right? So it's not like permanently write protected, but it's kept in a way that you can't directly commit to it, but there's ways to update it. Yes. So what we what we want to then achieve is that I cannot I cannot push to the main branch. I cannot change the main branch directly. But what I want to do instead is I want to put my suggestion on a branch and have somebody else look over it. And the somebody else will then look through my change, click on our green button, and this will integrate the changes into, into the main branch. And the advantage will be that at least one more person knows about this change. So knowledge transfer, learning, but also quality. Oh, are we ready to talk about exercise preparation? Just um, catching up here with the document. What have we missed? Yeah, yes, uh, Radon. I, I think we can prepare this exercise. Uh, but from the past experience, that is, uh, I think it's very important that we explain the difference between the, um, the exercise leads part and the people who follow, and also for the people who, who do not have an exercise lead before mm -hmm. we jump into the exercise, the, the, how the role play works. <clears throat> That's very important. Where should we start? What is, should I start with the stream participants or should I start with the team exercise room participants to explain what uh, they need to do? Yes, so we could, we could explain first the, the, the team lead. So they might, uh, they can, they have some time to prepare if they wish to, then we can go for the stream participants. Yes. Okay, so now only, only the team leads and exercise leads, please listen carefully. So this is only you will have to do that because you will have to set up an exercise repository for your group. And so, and here we call you, you are the administrator. But what if a group works together and they don't have an exercise lead? What should they do? I think they should maybe assign an administrator. One of you will be administrating the exercise repository. One of you will be the owner of it. And then you can generate the exercise repository from this template. So those of you who are exercise leads or administrators, you can follow this link. And we have screenshots. And then you can use this template and generate it into, into your favorite place. So, it could be your, your username, because later we can remove everything again. And this would be the exercise one. You can give it a good name. This will be the one, this will be the exercise. So Radovan, as promised, uh, I'm go just going to remind you that um, whether people should do this or just watch it. And you, you clearly said that it is for the exercise leads. So that should the exercise leads yeah. try this now? But I didn't, yeah, that's a good reminder because I didn't tell them whether they should do it or not do it. Um, I would say, okay, let's, let's take a step back here. If you are unsure about it, if this is the first time that you do that, maybe you try to do this with me. If you are an exercise lead, if you have seen this before, you can also do that at the beginning of the exercise session. So that's why we give 40 minutes. So there will be enough time for to do that. But if you follow, want to follow along, I want to now take a step back and do that again. So I follow this template link. I use this template. And then I need to decide where do I want to create this exercise repository in. It will be probably in your user account. So to make things consistent, I don't want to say that it should be you are like the, the, the exercise leads user account, not some public uh, 
project they're part of. So yes. please select your name. Yes. And I wonder whether for more consistency, should I give it the name the same as in our instructions? Yeah, unless you already have it. OK. This will be exercise one. And it's public because otherwise people will have maybe diff. No, we want it to be public. I think it will, it, you will, it's better if it's public. It will also work if it's private. I prefer public. Here, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I keep it unclicked. And now I create this exercise repository from the template. So only the group leaders do this only the administrators. So uh, Radon, while that uh, going on, um, uh, the, when, I, when I did this exercise uh, uh, several, um, several times, uh, it's, it's sometimes people can get a little confused because we are talking about four different places, URLs. Um, if you show me the, the template again in another tab, that I want to point out something that was useful for me. Okay, I'll open it because you see that this new repository actually remembers from where it was generated from. So I can, if I want, I can have a look at the template. Yeah, so if you, in the, in the big green button, if you see the word use this template, that means you are in the wrong place when you're contributing. So that's yeah. very clear. And the other, other place which start with your name, it, it doesn't have that button. It would say, yeah copy code or something. Yeah, so it shouldn't say code refinery here, it should say something else. And so this is the this is the repository that your group will participate in. There is one branch and there is one commit and there is one file. And for your group to be able to participate they will need to be added as collaborators. And this, so your group will communicate to you GitHub usernames through, if you are in the same room, maybe on the, I don't know, uh, on your own Zoom chat. And then you as a exercise lead, as administrator through settings, and through collaborators. And I need to now authenticate. Just a sec. A long and complicated password. And now you can, on settings, collaborators, here you can add people. For instance, I could add if Sabri was now in my team and I knew Sabri's username, which I remember. Oops. I could add Sabri as a collaborator to this repository. So there's a, there's a slight uh, ping from our colleagues, uh, Radon, uh -huh. um, to say what, what the streaming participants should do while this is happening. <laughs> I think they can so far relax and not do anything. We will, I will come to that in a moment. So all of this is only for the groups and it's actually only for the uh, administrators. Because for stream participants, we have to do it a little bit differently. And I will come back to, I will come to this in a minute. So now I can add Sabri and then I can add all my other team members to the repository. Now that I click here, Sabri gets an invitation to the repository. So Sabri now got an email in Sabri's inbox. So now all of your team members will have to check their email inbox and accept the invite to this repository. And only then they can push, push to it. Was that part clear? Yeah, well, I wanted to mention one more thing. And this is now for everybody to watch. or unwatch. Uh, when you participate in this exercise, 
And it doesn't matter whether you are part of a team, an exercise group, or whether you're partic participating via stream. Before you start exercising, I recommend that you unwatch. So on top, there will be this button here where you can watch or unwatch activity in this repository. And I will recommend to switch to, to this one, to participating in mentions and not be notified about all activity. What this will do is that if you if you don't change this, you will get email notifications about all the pull requests created by your exercise colleagues in the same team. This is not a big disaster, so you might get 10 emails. But just to make sure that if you don't want to get these 10 emails, before you start in the exercise, unwatch, you can, you can even ignore everything if you want to. So I want to do this. Everybody will want to do this. OK, but was that part somehow clear? Should I know? Then the rest. No. Uh, now I think the, the, the exercise lead, the other one, maybe they can um, start preparing if they wish. Yes, they can start preparing. They can start also communicating with the team, the GitHub usernames. And should I already explain what the goal is of the exercise or first explain what stream participants should do? Um, so yeah, so we could uh, say the stream participant and maybe the uh, collaboration, the, the exercise lead, they could start working on it, but sharing uh, usernames, they could do it when they're in the Zoom chat maybe easier yeah. because now yes. it might disturb the people who are listening if they try to collect uh, usernames. Good point. So what should I do now? Should I speak about stream or? Yes, we can go to the stream and maybe mention the difference between the recorded and unrecorded versions mm -hmm. and what they should do. Yes, so for stream, there we have set we have set this up already. Uh, we have two two different versions of it. And we have either sent you an email or we have put it on HackMD. Or the stream participants could open an issue in in this repository and ask to be added to as a collaborator. And we have done that. And if you still open issues, we will now also add you there. Same thing for you. Once we add you, you will get an email in your inbox from GitHub inviting you to this repository, which you then can accept. And then we will collaborate on one of these together. After the workshop, we will remove everything again. Still remember that everything that we will do here will be publicly accessible. And we, in any case, we always want to follow code of conduct. So when we do now changes, since we don't know exactly what will happen, we want to make sure to not make anybody else uncomfortable with, with any contributions. We have two versions here. We have one which will not be shown on stream and it will not be recorded. We have another one where you can then co contribute to, which we call centralized workflow exercise recorded. And this is the one that we will show on stream. You can choose, as a stream participant, you can choose where you want to then contribute to. We hope that at least some of you contribute to the recorded one so that we have something to show here, because then we can review your changes. We can discuss them. We will do that in a very nice way. And we can then learn together on how to contribute and how to review. Same here. Before you start exercising, and I will open the recorded one, it looks exactly the same. There is. There is one commit, there is one branch, there is one file. And also here, I recommend then before you start, you unwatch so that you don't get too many emails. Good. That's the setup. So, uh, so Radwan, just to make sure that uh, when you um, share your username uh, in the in the recorded version, the um, no information goes um, 
like 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 we we don't access your repository or anything. It just the it, there are two uh, versions. So if you don't want to show your username on the recording, um, that's why it's it's two. But you know yeah. it's, it's very safe to it's it's very um, yeah. very safe to contribute to that. Uh, and after after the exercise, as you said, we will delete it. Yeah, and if nobody wants to show up there, that's also okay. Then we will we will create one ourselves and we will review each other's work. So don't forget to accept the invitation. And I recommend to unwatch the repository to get fewer emails. Should I now explain what, what the point is of the exercise and what, what is the goal of it and where, where we want people to be, be at the end of it? Yes, so it's very important uh, uh, what we expect uh, from this. And one more thing to explain, uh, or one more thing to mention is Radhavan that when you get the email, more often it ends up in spam. The, the invitation email. So you have to check the spam folder as well. Uh, or you could also, there's this bell icon when you log into the Git, GitHub um, account that you could uh, see that shows um, notifications. So yeah. if you just missed all the, so check the spam folder or if it's not there, you could also use the bell icon. If the bell icon, yet another way to see where you have been invited to is you go on your icon here on your avatar and you click your organizations and you will see all the different places that you have been added to or invited to. And there you can find it as well. It, it will also go, it will go into the email that GitHub, that you have registered GitHub with, which might not be your university email. So this depends on, this is the email that GitHub knows. Yes, uh, so Ronald, I think it's safe to go, go to the exercise explanation. So I think uh, because people have uh, basic knowledge of what to do, maybe we, we, we don't have to tell them step by step do this, mm -hmm. but we can explain what the outcome is. And when they return, you and me, we can, or maybe even Richard can go through it. Sounds great. What do you think? So we will not go through all the steps. Everything is very nicely explained. There are infographics on what is going on. The point is we will now collaborate on a repository. You can you, you will create a new file. You can share a cooking recipe in there, or it can be a trick in Git that you learned recently. The goal of this exercise is to create a branch, create a file, push this branch, and create a pull request. So when you have opened a pull request, and we have screenshots, and everything is there, when you have opened the pull request, then you are done with your exercise. Then you can relax. You can, of course, look at what comes after. But we will then review these pull requests together then on stream. So there are steps, A, B, C, D, E, F, until H. Your, this is actually not true, really. You will have more time than this. But your goal is to work until step H. Some of you will finish earlier, but then help others in the, in the group or take a break. So somebody asked to, to clarify what is the goal. The goal is after all of this preparation to go through steps A to H below. And the goal will be to open a pull request. So when you have opened a pull request, you are done with the exercise. You can still look at the rest. You can still help others. Uh, but this is the goal of the exercise. Everything after step H, we will do them together. What else should we clarify? Uh, maybe question 19. So when you then... Um, so definitely in this exercise, you will create a modification on a new branch. You will create a new branch, and there you make a modification. The modification will not happen on master or main. And that is a good practice. Great. Welcome back. I hope this worked well. If you got stuck, it's not a problem, because we will also open a pull request here together as well. So then you can see, you can see how we do it and what other things that we look at.
let's maybe have a look at some of the pull requests that we got via the stream. And then in those of you who work in teams and in exercise groups, you can then also then to, together with us start reviewing the pull request that you have received. But we will hear, I will follow the one centralized workflow exercise recorded and let's see what we got. What do I see here? I see that there are 18, 18 pull requests are open. And if I click on those, I see all of them. They have a title. Each of them has a number. They are numbered in the in the order that they came in that they came in. And we will we will have a look at some of these together and discuss. And maybe before going there, I want to show you one neat thing, which is the on top, it's insights and network. Insights Network. I would love to make it nicer. Because what, what we see in this overview is very tiny, but there is the master branch with one commit. But we see that all the, we see all the other branches appearing here. So all of these branches are here listed and each of them has one commit, one branch has two commits. So it's no problem to collect multiple commits in a, in a branch. There is even one branch which branched out from another branch. None of them has yet been integrated to the master branch. We have made the master branch write protected. So all of the changes will go through pull requests. And now we will do the review uh, together. Mm -hmm. One one small thing before you go out of okay. So in the diagram we saw that like the master branch is like a trunk, but all the uh, other branches they are um sort of starting from the master branch but in a, in a real life scenario you might not see this sort of like a uh, master branch as as the sort of like a trunk and others branching out here we see this because we did it independently and uh, everybody started from the master branch and did one commit so that's why mm -hmm. this sort of view we see here mm -hmm. later on we can have a look more of a realistic uh, graph Great, and now we want to see how can we integrate these changes. We want to first, so I wonder whether we should first submit a pull request ourselves, or maybe we'll do that later. And um, now look at how can we integrate these changes. So for this, I go to pull request. And we can now review them in any order. Um, we can maybe start with, with the one that came first. So. It, it carries the number two because also issues are numbered and pull requests are numbered and on GitHub, these are numbered consecutively. Should I open this one? Let's do that. So what are the things that, what do we see here? We see each pull request carries a title. It's it's hopefully self-descriptive. We also see from which branch to which branch this pull request is intended to. Um, there can be more description here if needed. In this discussion thread, we can also, we can have a discussion here. And suggest changes, have a, suggestions. We will in a moment show you them how. Here, I can also involve more people. If I need advice, I can even mention somebody. Oh, hey, uh, Sabri, what do you think about this one? And if I would now post this, then Sabri would get an email notification and get, can get them involved in this discussion and 
who will appear here as a participant. Before, before merging a change, what I normally do is, well, I look at the title um, and I also look at, I mean, here it is a small change, but I look at the description. I also click at file changed. What is it really that is being submitted here? So this is now, it's now a poem. It will create a file with this file name. And if we are happy with this change, and I think in this case, I am happy. I will click merge and confirm merge. And now the branch got merged into the master branch. And it is also nice to say thank you for this change. And I can even delete the branch. And it will not delete the commit. It will delete this sticky note. And maybe before looking at other pull requests, we can have another look at the insights network. And I will see that now, now this commit got integrated into the master branch. And now we will try to merge more of these changes together. And now I also I encourage those of you who work with inside a group, inside a team, you can you can do this review and review each other's changes. Uh, maybe before doing that, if I look at pull requests, I see that there are there are two changes that I submitted. So now I have a question to Sabri, should I review my own changes? Um, so the so the best practice is you don't review your own change. So another person should review that. So I could do that when uh, when I get the next uh, screen share. Maybe after you go through one more example, maybe. Uh, and this review is um, is um, is a concept that we use a lot in um, coding. Uh, so the review does not has to be done uh, by an expert than the submitter. <clears throat> Let's say it is quite natural, a student reviews um, a supervisor's code. Uh, that is a very good way to learn, for example. Mm -hmm. So in a team, there might be junior members reviewing. So reviewing is not a, a policing act or a correction act. It is also a learning experience um, in itself. <clears throat> yes, and everybody, it's good if, you know, in a project, everybody is equal. Nobody is more equal. Well, so this review process then counts for everybody. Of course, now you also may ask, what if I'm alone in the project? Who can review then my changes? And maybe somebody can ask the question I can, on the document, and maybe we can also find some answers there. So that's that's a problem many people have, that they work isolated. And how can they get a code review? But let's see a little bit more changes here. I, I want to have a look at this dinner recipe. This is a pull request with two commits. Some ingredients were added, then some more changes. Um, and it's an interesting recipe. I want to test it out. I would like to have that in our recipe collection. Mm -hmm. Uh, oh. Radon, mm -hmm. um, before you move away from that uh, the file, so here, uh, if you look closely, that there are some other additional information Git gives us. One information is the are those green lines numbered one, two, three. So those are the new lines included in this uh, commit. So if there if there's a red line here, that means a line that has been deleted. So Git is checking line by line here. So each line it's checking, is it new or is, is, is it something removed or is it already existing? Here, everything is green because it's a new file. So that was not there before. Mm -hmm. And there are these little plus signs and I can even comment on particular lines. So if I want to comment on this one, I can say, oh, yeah, I really like broccoli. And add a single comment. And it will show up, this comment will show up in this when I click back to conversation. Do I still have network? So 
Sabri, you are still here, right? Am I still here? Uh, yeah, 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 you're here. You are here. Okay. As far as I can hear, you are here. Okay, so what? why can't I click back here? Interesting. Let's reload. I want to go back to conversation. Here it is. Yes. So then in my conversation thread, um, you can then see these single line comments. You can comment on a line, you can comment on a portion of, of a code. Oh, the other thing is that when I review the changes, there is also this review changes. So if you make it, if you want to make it a little bit more formal, you can even agree in a project that each change should be reviewed by one person or two other people. And then you can give this more formal approval. Because then it will show up that aha, this person has approved these changes. And then you can wait until another person has approved these changes. So here we are happy. Let's merge. Confirm. And now it's now it got merged into master. And again, I can delete the branch. Uh, so to... Ron, as we are at it, why did it get merged to master but not something else? Because it was intended, this pull request was sent from this or source branch to this destination branch. You can also open a pull request from whatever branch to whatever other branch, but very often we will want to merge into the main development line, which happens to be master here. So this this determined how things got merged. So when you submit your pull request, uh, if you look closely on the top, uh, you will get this uh, selection branch selection. Uh, so you have to um, like uh, if if um, if if the main development branch because now here in this uh, repo we have defined as the default branch as master so it's uh, it could be called something else mm -hmm. so during the pull request you get actually a chance to select uh, where should your pull request end up. That should I open a pull request now or should we do it later because I would like to also show that. Uh, let's open it then. Do you have a, a commit somewhere? I can, I, I can send something maybe. I can make one here. Okay. Or, or do you want to take the screen and create a commit? I want no, to I, create I, a commit that is unfinished. So some like unfinished idea. Hmm. Should uh, I do so that then, here? Yeah, yeah. So that is for the draft, right? Yes. So draft, we uh, do it a little later. Let's show the... Um, um, you know, as you're in the terminal, just go ahead. Hold on. Just go ahead. And something unfinished or something good? Um, something unfinished are the second thing maybe. First, we'll do the finished one. All right. So as always, I will do a new, first, before I do anything, I do a new branch. How should I call it? Um, recipe T. And, and here you had a, uh, combined git checkout and git uh, branch into one command. So you'll create the branch and check out a yes. uh, single process. <clears throat> Boil water or into mark some more steps. Save, yes. Git add. Git commit um, the recipe. And now, <clears throat> git status. I'm still on this on this branch here. And git push origin. And so what am I pushing? I'm pushing this branch. Where to? To origin. Uh, so if, uh, uh, people who are not uh, sort of configured Git uh, with default setups, it would be good practice when you uh, push the branch for the first time to set an upstream. Oh, you have yes. uh, some explanation of that? <clears throat> yeah, so I sometimes forget to do that. And, and it is okay not to do it. So it will be this one, the minus U. And we have it in, <clears throat> we have it in instructions. So this is the first time I ever push my branch to origin because if i do that it will it will connect the two it will it will know that the local rather one recipe t and the the one on origin they are connected and then from there on i can do git pull and git push without typing this explicitly 
I admit that sometimes I forget this, and I always prefer to explicitly type what am I pushing and where to. So it doesn't really matter whether I edit here or not, but let's let's add it. And now there are many several ways to open a pull request. One way is among this gobbledygook, there is this one link. And if I follow it, if I follow this link in my browser, it will open a pull request form. But what if I don't see this or I just scrolled away? If I don't see this, I can go on back to the repository. And if I reload the page, there is this yellow box here because GitHub knows that I'm logged in. I pushed a branch. Maybe I wanted to create a pull request from it. So I can also do it here. Uh, so even if you even uh, if you miss that one, how 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 would one go? If I miss this one, yeah. Oh, uh, and even if I if I come back a few days later, it will maybe not be there the window. So there are still more ways to do it. One is clicking on pull requests, and then there is a green button here, new pull request. So that's one way. And then yet another way is. If you click on branches, there are now 20 branches because we got 20 contributions. If I click on branches, I can also create a pull request from the corresponding branch. So I can also do it here. And all of them will open the same form. And the first thing I look when I open a pull request is from where to where, is this really what I wanted? Is this from my branch towards master? Yes, that's what I wanted. Give it a good title and more context here. Here you can also refer to an issue discussion or previous discussion or something. And I also, before I click here, I also have a look at what am I actually sending here? What is the change and what are the commits? If I see changes here that I didn't, don't remember, and if I see commits here that I don't remember doing, then maybe I made a mistake and then I stop and I pause and have, I have a look, what did I really do? So these are things that I look at before, before creating it. We will discuss a bit more how we review changes. We want to show you a couple of more really nice features that can help with this. And then we will take it uh, to the next level still. I got, during the break, I got, an, I got a good suggestion here to my pull request. So before the break, I open a pull request with a recipe for tea, but my reviewer added a suggestion where is the tea bag. So now how do I make changes to a pull request? Should I close it and open a new one? No, I don't, this is not, I don't have to do that. If I want to make additions to my pull request, all I have to do is I, I push new commits to the same branch. If I push new commits to the same branch, they get added to the pull request. So let's go locally on my computer. I will go to the same branch and let's add this uh, T back. We really need that. Don't forget, T back. Of course, there are more details. Yes, and now git add, git commit. Um, adding t back. The commit still exists only on my computer until I type git push, git push origin. And I want to make sure that this goes to the same what was the name of the branch? Recipe T. It goes to the same to the same branch. And only now we will see now the website updated itself because now the new commit got added to the pull request. Also, if I look at files changed, there are two commits, and there is the T bag that somebody asked for. And maybe now somebody will be happy with my changes and merge them. 
Good. I wanted to show you one more thing. During the break, I created a branch. And I called it unfinished idea. Let's see what is in that branch. So I, it all started with an idea. It's something that is unfinished, but I want to show it to other people because I, I want to get feedback. I want to get feedback before I add more code to this. Am I on the right track? Um, this is some unfinished code, but I really want somebody to crit critique it. Um, getting suggestion on something unfinished can be much more useful than getting suggestion on something that is already finished. And there is a nice mechanism to, to share something where I want to get feedback, but I don't want this to be merged. And I can do this by selecting here. I can open a draft pull request. And a draft pull request, it's marked as draft. And this also exists on GitLab. Um, this cannot be merged. Nobody can merge this because it's not intended to be merged. All I want to do is I want people to look at it and give me suggestions on how to go from here. And only, so then I will do some more work and I will add some more commits. And only when I'm ready and when I'm happy, I can then mark it as ready for review and only then it can be merged. So this is a really nice mechanism. Okay, I wanted to do some more code reviewing here. We got a lot more pull requests piling up. And soon you can help me with those as well because many of you have write permissions. But let me look at two of them. I want to have two of them I want to review myself. I want to review number 13 and I want to review number six here on stream. Because here we got a different dinner recipe. The interesting thing about this pull request is that it is conflicting because intentionally, in this case, the submitter sent in the same file, but it had it was modified in two different ways. I could now ask the submitter to please resolve the conflict in your computer and then send an update to this pull request. But I don't have to do that. We can also resolve, we can look at conflicts and resolve them here through the browser. Let's have a look at the conflict, resolve conflicts. And this will maybe look a little bit familiar. So we have these, we have these conflict markers. This recipe line, there are two versions of it. And now we need to decide, well, should it be half or should it be two? I will be a little bit conservative and go with half. And the way to resolve it is decide which one you like, remove the rest, and then mark it as resolved. This will create a new commit. So there will be a commit appearing for me because I was the one reviewing and I was the one resolving the conflict. But now this branch can be merged. So we have, we have seen conflicts can be resolved and can be discussed uh, through the browser as well. OK, there are two more things that we want to show you with Sabri. And one of them is, and for this, I will open up Sabri's pull request. But I really appreciate all of your pull requests. And, and now, please also help me reviewing them. So practice okay. reviewing other people's pull requests as well. 13. Mm -hmm. 13. 13. All right. So the 13 I want to do here on stream because there are two things we want to show you. One is, so it's a good trick. It may conflict with number three, but fortunately, we didn't merge that yet. Um, what is happening here? Uh, it's a explanation of, on how git show works. But what is also interesting here, so what is this thing here? Closes, what is that? And you can see that if I navigate over it, it
it refers to it refers to an issue. Let's open up issues in a different tab. So there is there are two issues open. One of them is the issue number five. And here Sabri already announced what he wanted to do. That can be another nice way to inform the group. What am I working on? It can also be a nice way to collect feedback before doing all this coding. So before writing 20,000 lines of code, explain the idea, collect feedback. Is this the best way? Yes. It was a really good idea. And then notice how Sabri in the commit message has referenced the issue number five, and he has used a magic word called closes. So there is close, closes, fix, fixes. The pull request and the issue got cross-referenced. And the moment, if I merge the, the pull request, I don't want to merge it quite yet, but if I would click on the merge pull request, it would automatically close the issue. That's a, another nice mechanism. Just catching up here with questions. I think I want to show you one more thing. And that is how to make a suggestion to a change. Because I told you that if I want to change, I could I could ask us something for this. Can you please change this and that? And then we know how to do it. We create a new commit, we push it to the branch. But what if this is um what if this is some minor change and I already know what I want and can I suggest it here directly? What if I want a dollar sign in front of the Git show? I could ask somebody for the dollar sign, but there is a much nicer way and that is that I can suggest it directly. You, I can click on the, on the plus. I can either give comments, but there is this little tiny plus minus, which is adding a suggestion. And if you click on that, then I can suggest directly add a single comment. And now, if I go back to the conversation, is it then reload? Here it is. Now, Sabri doesn't have to open up the terminal, create a new commit, git push origin branch. Now, if Sabri agrees with my suggestion or somebody else agrees with my suggestion, it can be committed by clicking this button. And then a new commit appears. And then we can, we can merge these changes. Did we forget something? Oh, yes, I remember one thing. But before, maybe before doing this final thing is, now I encourage all of you within your exercises, also the stream participants, practice this, review somebody else's change. Of course, always very constructively and practice this mechanism, voice. And before handing over to Sabri, I wanted to show you one more thing, which you can all also all try now. So everybody can try that with me. If it fails, it's not a problem for later. So for later, we do we will do something else. But what I want to show you is that now that we have started merging changes, I see many files appearing here on, on GitHub. If you look at the network, you will also see that many of these branches have been now integrated into master. But on my local computer, I don't see all these files. I see only the readme and I see only my own file. And if I would type git graph, my git graph would look different than the graph on, on GitHub. And this is because, just because there were changes on GitHub, they don't automatically go to my computer. 
The Git repository on my computer and the Git repository on GitHub are two separate repositories. They are related, but they are not automatically synchronized. So if I want to synchronize my computer, if I want to have these changes, how do I do this? I do the opposite of git push. The opposite of git push is git pull. So first make sure that you are on the master branch because this command will modify your current branch. So I want, I want to make sure that I run this on the master branch. And then git pull from where, from origin, which branch, master. I want to pull all the commits on master from origin and integrate them into my local, into my current branch. Git pull origin master. It's the opposite of git push origin master. And now all of these changes, all your commits and your files, they also now exist on my computer. If I would now run git graph, it will maybe look a little bit wild. It will resemble the, the network graph on GitHub. And all of your changes are here. So please try it as well. And that's the last thing I wanted to show in this episode. I will try to take the screen again, Radwan. It might flicker a little bit, but you'll be back. OK. So thanks, thanks everybody for participating in this uh, in this first exercise. But we have one more for you. Yes, um, it went outside. Let me. Radwan, can you take it back and give it to me? I, I don't know to refresh it. So should I send yeah. again? Just yes. steal, steal the steal the screen share. Otherwise, what we can also do in emergency situation is that I keep it and you tell me what to do, and I will do it here. Yeah, we'll try one more time, not to waste time, and then we'll go for it. Yes. Mm, yes. There's a little bit more, but I think it, we could manage it. Uh, so Radovan, uh, uh, until I sort of um, tile this, um, what what is the use case? When, when do you need a fork uh, to remind ourselves? Um, yeah, the use case is so far we had we were collaborator, but if if I'm not collaborator, I want to make a change to somebody else's repository and I'm not part of that group, I'm not part of, I'm not a collaborator of this repository, then I need a different mechanism. And the mechanism is I have to make a fork first. Mm. And we, we remind ourselves that the fork is also a copy, but it's a copy that will live in the cloud on GitHub. Okay, so um, my screen looks good, uh, Richard. Is it uh, enough for the recording? Yes. So Radovan, as you said, uh, not a collaborator. Uh, so if I sort of rephrase uh, what you said, it's like, especially when I don't have right access to the uh, to the repository. So if you think about a big project like NumPy uh, or any other, the Unix kernel, or the, those are the two examples we always take during the sessions. Uh, it's difficult to trust everybody. You don't know, like there might be, um, um, pull requests coming from people who are, who are who you have no idea. Most of it are good, but maybe some malicious in intent uh, could be there to break the code. So we don't know. Um, so in that case, it's better not to give the sort of right permission, but instead go through this uh, process. Um, to go, go through this uh, process, um, I will, um, uh, so this diagram I, I had to write down. So they, we have a accessibility violation, sorry about here we have used green and red. Yeah, we'll fix that. Um, so again, the central um, um, term, it is just a um, repository that we decided to make it central. So any of these could have been central um, as well. 
Um, so we talk about now, instead of um, cloning directly from that central place, we could make a copy on the um, cloud itself, which we call a fork, and then uh, clone from that place. Um, so this is the, um, let's see, the code refinery, the Git collaborative lesson that we are in uh, Radwan. Am I in the correct place? Yes. Um, so here you see that um, the code refinery team um, has write access, so they could create branches and um, do the changes. But you, could, you also see here that there are folks, there are 38 people who has made copies of it and have it on their um, GitHub um, cloud uh, place or whatever you call it, uh, the Git, GitHub. Um, so then uh, what we do is, so we, um, so I will try to explain this um, in, in line with the expected exercise. Um, so um, the, the thing we are going to learn here is to contribute to some place that you don't have write access. So you're not uh, like a part of the uh, team which has write access to the um, um, repo, but we are going to do it in a way that um, I would call it like socially responsibly, resp responsible and uh, a good DO practice that you know, a development practice. Um, so anybody can uh, propose contribution and um, you don't have to give them uh, permission uh, to write. Um, and the maintainers, they have full control of what, what is major, what is merged, what is integrated into the main line of development. Um, so uh, we will we'll come back to this um, term in a, in, a, in a moment about having multiple remotes. Um, then having this kind of uh, setup that you have at a central repository, but if it is very big, it can, it can be overwhelming for the um, maintainers as well. Uh, but if if you are going to do something like that, if I am going to host um, a place where I, I expect people to fork, there should be a mechanism for the review. So you can't just expect that people to fork and send requests and go uh, stale. You know, if 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 the if the folks become fall behind too far, then it's hard to uh, integrate these things sensibly. Um, this this thing I will show in a moment. Uh, so in line of the exercise that we are going to expect, uh, we are going to sort of um, expect uh, people to do. Uh, Radhan, as in the previous exercise, we have two tabs here. One is that if you want to do it in a sort of local team and the team lead, use this template to create a um, repository on his private uh, GitHub and share the link with the participant, but do not give them right access. So the difference between the last time and this time is last time we added the participants, the, the group members to the um, repository itself as collaborators. This time we only give them the link so they can make a write, write, uh, writable copy. And for the participants, uh, who are following via the stream and those who do not um, have a, like exercise lead to create this first uh, preparation part. They could either follow the non-recorded part if, you, if they don't want to show their username in the recording or they could follow the recorded part. So the recorded part is um, um, the forking workflow exercise recorded. So the first thing uh, one would do is because I want to show this remote thing. So I would go and fork to my uh, private GitHub account. So and this is uh, something uh, something we should do now or later. Thank you for reminding. So what I'm going to do is to explain these uh, terms a little bit before you jump into the exercise. 
So do not follow me, just watch because I'm, I'm doing this so I can get to a point where I can show what this um, uh, terms mean. So I, um, I'm going to do some certain clicks. I'm expecting you to watch and not to follow me. Uh, so Radon, how important is it to the copy the master branch only thing in this exercise? Yeah, it doesn't matter. So it doesn't matter whether it's checked or not. We only need that one, one branch. So uh, when you finish your, um, the, the clone, you will see that, uh, sorry, the fork, the fork, the clone is uh, the term we use when you copy it to the laptop. You will see that the exact copy of um, the centralized repository or the repository that we are talking about here is created inside my um, my, my private uh, repository. So this start with this CR workshop exercise owner, and here I am the owner. But now these are disconnected in the sense that uh, if, if I don't explicitly ask it to be synchronized, the code will be um, different in either place. Um, so then uh, as we did with the other exercise, we're going to um, clone this. Uh, also, don't 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 uh, follow my, my typing. So I'm just uh, going to show you um, some some terms that uh, in the exercise before we go into that. So I'm this in this folder. I have uh, two folders, and then I'm going to paste that um, the cop the the URL I copied from SSH uh, tab, and I'm going to ask Git to clone it. So the thing I wanted to show was, so when you're copying, when you're in two, maybe in two tabs, you don't clone this one, the central one, or the one your exercise lead creates. So you clone after forking, you clone from the forking. And then I'm not going to give a name uh, for the folder. So I'm expecting it to be uh, use the default name. So I have, um, here, the folder created uh, by cloning my fork, then I'm going to change into that directory and show this command. Git remote minus a. So when you show this verbose output of git remote, you have to make sure that before you proceed too much, that it is the URL that from the fork, not from the main, the, the one the exercise link shows, or if you're following in stream, the centralized workshop. So let's say just in case if you um, got the wrong one, um, the, the wrong URL, you can, uh, you, you see that this long URL, it has given a short name called origin, uh, was it remove or delete? Remove origin, let's try that. And then if you ask git remote, we will not show, then you can say git remote at origin and then the correct uh, URL. So what, what I have done here is that after cloning, I made sure that I am working on my fork. So if I accidentally copied the wrong URL, it's also possible to remove it using this name and then add it again. So Radon, was it um, sort of clear that uh, that um, that could be that you have to make sure that you, you work on your fork, not the yes. centralized repository? Yes, and this is because you you can write to your fork, but you, in this case you cannot write to the central repository. The yes. exercise setup will be a little bit easier because this time we don't need to we don't need to communicate any usernames and we don't need to add any collaborators because that's exactly the point of the exercise. Yeah. So there is a little bit less to do now. A little bit less to do, um, um, so, but if if you if you don't uh, sort of got, got the wrong repo setup, delete it and add the correct. Otherwise, the the exercise will not work as expected. So now I jump back to the exercise again. 
so that is the, the, the pitfall I wanted to show. Uh, it's always good to use this command remote verbose to see that it is same as dash V. Uh, so I use the shortcut. So you could use the dash dash verbose just to, just to be consistent with the material. So it will show the same thing. Um, so right on the expected uh, outcome of this exercise is that you send a pull request as before, but not from your local computer directly, but where your fork. In order to do that, there are three methods, three paths you may take. One is the, uh, for the teams uh, which have a um, excise lead. The excise lead will generate uh, a repository on, or on his or her look, uh, GitHub account and they will share the link or people who follow the stream, they will use one of these. So if you are not that concerned about showing your username on internet, I'll recommend that using this. So after do, using that, you could follow the steps that I, I did. So you should uh, read again uh, the step. You should fork and then clone it and make sure that your correct uh, remote is set up in this way. Uh, after that, you can proceed with the steps. And then when we come back, we could um, talk, uh, we, 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 Radwan and me, we can go through the exercise um, step by step. So Radwan, um, uh, would you like to rephrase? Uh, so again, summarize the things yeah. I said. So summary of the exercises. In this case, no adding collaborators. You don't need to exchange usernames. Make sure you clone the, the right one. The right one is the one that is in your user space. Um, inside, otherwise it's very similar to the previous exercise. There is one bonus that you can try. What you can try is open an issue and reference the issue in your commit. Then you can see that you can auto close issue with this. We also need to plan a little bit because now we have half an hour left in the workshop. So what, what's our strategy for how long is the exercise? When is a break? How do we plan this remaining half an hour? Uh, so how far from uh, how far it has been since our last break, uh, Richard? Mm, I don't remember exactly. I can find in HackMD until 25. So we are half, half an hour uh, since the break, I guess. Yeah. So I guess in so, theory, you could go until the end. Yes. So. So Radwan, the the thing is, um, we'll give yeah. twenty minutes for the exercise. I would like to give maybe thirty. Yeah. But uh, I think ten minutes we should save for the for the discussion. Yeah, discussion. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so now uh, I I would now stop here and uh, I let you go to the exercise and and when you create the issue that was a very good point uh, that Radwan mentioned. You create it in the central place, not in the in your repo. The issue is created from the place where you go forked, not, not in the place, the your private repository. Um, that is how the, the, the process works. So, okay, now um, go to the exercise, read through it and make sure when you, you fork and clone the correct uh, repository and good luck. See you back in another 20 minutes. I have here on my screen, a pull request ready to be sent. And I want to show you that there are at least two things now different. One thing that is different is that on top, it's not any longer branch from branch to which branch inside the same repository. What is now different is that now I'm sending a pull request from one repository to the other, from the repository where I have write permissions to the repository where I don't have write permissions. And again, I can select from which branch to which branch. Otherwise, it looks pretty similar. This is some recipe. The other modification that I did, but Sabri already showed us how to do that previously, is that in my commit message, I reference the issue with this magic word so that once it gets integrated, the issue gets closed. I think I'm ready to send it. And then I will give over the screen to Sabri. And it is created and you can take it from me.
Okay, thank you, Ron. So um, this is the the central, um, you know, the the place where we define it as central. Let's see whether there are any pull requests coming up. Um, so here I already see that Radwan's uh, suggestion, um, and I go through the review, and then uh, if there's any changes that I want, uh, as Radwan showed before, we could uh, do that. Uh, but it looks good to me. There is one more new thing that I don't know whether you want to mention it. This little green check mark after after the commit that you can see now. Yes, yes. So that's a that's a uh, that's a test. Um, so this um, repo, if you look closely, there's this file called test.py. So this file this file goes and checks whether the word taco is there in the in the file you submit. So this is sort of an introduction to testing, automated testing. So if the word taco is not there, this will be not um, become uh, green, it will be red. So if Radwan, if you can send me a, like a different pull request at the end, if you have time to look at uh, to, uh, without the word taco. I will do so that. And, I, so, and it is of course a silly test, but we will then next week teach you how you can set up real testing in your projects. Hmm. I will merge the, the suggestions. Um, and here, if you see that I didn't get the message which says we want to delete the branch, for example, because it came from Radovan's repo. Now it's there. I want to go back to the workflow exercise, to the main page. Um, and see, um, look, look at this file. So this was the suggestion that was sent uh, in the master branch. If I go back and look again, in the master branch, I see this file. But in my fork, I'll refresh it just to show there, show there's no, no cheating going on. I don't see that file. Um, under master. Here I could just uh, go and make a sync my uh, fork with the central repository, but I'm going to take uh, a different route in this sense because in my local uh, Git remote, if you remember, I, I made the uh, clone from my repo, not the central one. Uh, I don't have that file either. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask which branch I'm in. Uh, I'm going to move to my master branch to be consistent with every, everything we are looking at. When I do the LS, I don't see Radovan's um, spicy taco uh, file. So how do we get this file in all the places? So I'm going to show the, the longer route. So it will have different uh, um, to cover all the possibilities. Um, so if you remember, um, we have uh, added this one remote, which is the, the fork. I could also add, uh, let's say I'll call it git remote. I'm going to call it the central because I will be using that word a lot and at this um, URL. So earlier, if you remember in the beginning of the exercise, I said, don't use this URL, but I'm going to use it now. And I'm going to paste that URL. So now we see the um, code define the central repo. Then if I ask again, get remote. Now we have, um, let me make it slightly smaller. You can maybe see the whole uh, URL. I see four. So that's the central place for fetch, central place of fush, and the origin, which is the, the my uh, fork um, for fetch and uh, push. But in this case, because we did not allow people to um, have right access, the fetch will work, but the push should not work in a, in a real case scenario. Now I'm going to ask again, uh, where am I located? 
make this slightly bigger maybe so I have more space here a little bit to show. And I'm going to do a git tool. Usually we use the word origin. Instead, I'm going to use the word central here. Master. So what does this tell you, uh, Radwan? These four terms. It will tell me that I pull changes of from the place called central, which refers to to this to some address yeah. into yeah. and and the master branch into my current branch. Current branch. So it will pull, and you got the changes. If you look closely, the spicy taco has been downloaded. So it's there, it's the same file. This, the thing I did, I could have done this like this on instead, but it's not convenient. I could have used the full URL instead, which means the same thing, but now it is already updated. But this, uh, because I, I, I use this alias central here, so I can conveniently um, call this like this. But doing this even, do not, uh, get me the file to my fork. So what I can do is, so if I say git push, this will go to central repository, we should fail. Now, instead of central, I use origin. Did you see that difference um, right on the, the day? Mm -hmm. I got it and I send it back. So we pulled from central, we pushed it or into origin. Mm. And if I go here now, fortunately, uh, not fortunately, like, you know, that should have happened. It's not fortune, it's that's how it's set up. So I see that file here. So instead of going through that, I could say, but now I don't see any uh, update here. I, I need one more update. Um, is there any and other we have, request? We have one minute left, but no stress. But let's let's now really say the most important things in the remaining minute that we have. Okay. So here you see that the, the word taco is not there, that test failed. Um, let's see. Yeah, so I, I will just uh, push for something that passed the, so this one is really hot, it seems. So I'm going to workflow waiting for approval to, uh, to run. So this, uh, because Radwan, when you said, because, uh, said, because you are a admin, we didn't see this. So now the test will run for this um, pull request. So it will complete. And when it's, when it's complete, I would say uh, white pull request. Then I should say, uh, see the sync again here. Um, so I don't know until these things happen, uh, finalize, can, uh, do you want to say anything more about the uh, um, collaboration part next, like people could read about it and we also, but we have covered most of it here live. I mean, if we can go like two minutes over time and we will only mention something that is in the in the material, the final episode is how to contribute changes to somebody else's project. Mm. So maybe I just wanted to finish that by taking a step back. Now we have seen these different models. And so how should I start? Uh, if I, if it's somebody else's project, I want to make a change. It doesn't mean that I want to, I just want to have the change in my own space. Let's say I want to take Radovan's terminal setup, but I want to change the yellow color to something more readable. I want to make it purple. Doesn't mean I want to contribute it back, but so how should people start making changes, suggesting changes to somebody else? So the first thing is to understand and ask, um, open an issue. In that case, we have to open the discussion first before you write a lot of code, which has been emphasized throughout this course. Um, so here there's an issue that we learn how to refer to issues and um, in the, in the previous uh, examples. So here the discussion happens. You know, before you, you know, start coding, look at it. Um, and if I step even further back, even before you clone that I should, something I should have 
installed is when you are contributing, you should check whether there's a license file, which we talk about in another, um, the next uh, lecture. So you should have had, actually had a look at the license file to see whether that is something you want to contribute. After that, you open an issue. Then after the discussion, you can uh, fork it, uh, do the changes, test it yourself that it works perfectly and they send a pull request and through the uh, to, uh, and follow up the reviews, but the uh, reviewer says, and make the changes and then it will be a, a socially responsible contribution uh, that you make. And the community key was open an issue and discuss first, because maybe what you want to do is a very good idea, but maybe it already exists. Maybe it's somewhere there. The code is so big that what you plan to do already exists. Unless this is a minor thing, if it's a typo fix, if it's something that obviously should go in, I mean, then maybe I go without the issue. Then I fork and send a pull request. Thanks everybody for listening. Thanks for your patience. Thanks to the exercise leads, expert helpers for helping out. I wish I could also go into the different rooms and participate next time. Yes, Should we thank you very much for all the organizers and, and also the questions and, and for the active participation. So this is like a, not a, like a, the code refinery, the lectures and all this, it's not like a lecture that you learn and pass exam, it is just, we learn together. So by preparing this lecture, I learned things. So it's yeah. sort of like a actively collaboratively learning uh, experience. Thank you everybody. Uh, should we give a preview of what to expect for next week. So next week, we no longer focus on Git so much, but instead we go to more software development tools. So things like uh, testing or documentation and so on. So basically every one of these lessons also serves as Git practice because most of them use Git under the hood to do what we're doing. But if what if you want more practice, what we did this week, next week we'll do that. If you don't want more practice and you want to just do something else, next week also serves that purpose pretty well. So, yeah, it will be. What do people need to prepare for next week? So, what is the most important thing to prepare? So, in the install instructions, we set up this conda environment. And we haven't used that this week, but next week it becomes the main focus. So you really should go and check that out and do the verification and make sure it works. Because if it doesn't work, it can be really hard to debug. I would recommend doing it today or tomorrow. So that way you have a day to ask someone local if there's some issue with the setup. Please give more feedback. I see it claims a hundred people online with the notes and there's not, not that many things. The poll is multi-choice, so answer all that are relevant to you. For next time, I think we'll probably try to focus more on exercises next week. Yeah. What do you say it's more exercise focused? Yeah, it seems that our, our explanations were a little bit too lengthy. And maybe we should give more time in the exercises yeah. and leave more to the exercises. Is HackMD a good way to answer questions? Like if we gave shorter explanations, but then relied on HackMD to answer the questions as they came up, would that be a good balance? Well, I guess if you would like, write that in the HackMD and we will notice. Um, yeah. So I guess we will 
resume. Mm, next week. Really looking forward. So thanks so much, Richard. Thanks, Sabri, for co-teaching. Thanks, everybody, and see you next week. Yes, see you then. Bye.